good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So good to be back with you, and uh, what a privilege, as Carter was saying, uh, to be able to meet together in fellowship and open up his word together. It's uh, quite the honor for me to be able to preaching with, uh, to be able to preach with people before me. I certainly enjoy it this way better. So glad to have you out. I also want to wish all you fathers happy Father's Day. Uh, we're so thankful for you. Well, let's get right into the Word of God. And so if you have a Bible, please turn them with me to the Gospel of Matthew. We're looking at Matthew chapter 4 at the temptation of Christ. A very important passage of Scripture. So Matthew chapter 4, we're going to look at this entire account. And it's found in verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 4, beginning to read in verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high and high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. This is the word of God, and thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we know that your word is truth and that it has the power to save and the power to sanctify. And so as we open it up, we ask that you would open up our eyes. Help us to see what this is all about. Help us to be enamored by all that Christ has accomplished for us in his life and coming here to fulfill all righteousness so that we would be able to receive this righteousness and the only righteousness by which we can have a right standing with holy God. Father, I thank you for bringing these people out this morning. Thank you for them being here. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would seal these words to our hearts such that they would transform us and affect us and, Lord, just dazzle us over Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help me as I preach, that you might fill me with your spirit. And even though I am frail and weak, Lord, you are strong. And so I pray that you would demonstrate the strength of your power by speaking, speaking even through a broken vessel. And God, that's all we are. God, we are so unworthy of your grace, and yet you have just lavished grace upon grace upon us. And we thank you for that. And so as we turn to your word, I just pray, O oh God, that you would stretch our minds and our hearts and help us to see Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul wrote some very practical words to a beleaguered congregation that was struggling internally with many different sins and he wrote these very practical words in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, when he said, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Well, isn't it great news to know that our God is so faithful to his children that he has provided a way for us to escape temptation. Yet isn't it also true that although God is faithful, 
that very often we are found to be unfaithful and have given in to temptation. I mean, how many of us can say that we have never succumbed to temptation? You see, all of us have given in to temptation because we have all sinned. And if you have sinned, then you have given in to temptation. And we are prone to sin in many ways. We are prone to be tempted in many ways. You may be tempted to pride, to cheating, to lusting, to engage in sexual immorality, to anger, and to avoiding those in need. And because of that, we have to realize that when we approach this passage, that there is a massive, lengthy distance between Jesus and us. Because I have not lived my life on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But Jesus literally lived his life, the entirety of his life, upon every dot and iota found in the word of God. And so as we approach Matthew chapter 4, we have to realize that this isn't just about providing us with a good example to follow, although it certainly is a good example to follow. It's primarily to show us that our failure can be replaced with his victory. We saw that last week when Jesus, at his baptism, he told John the Baptist that he came to fulfill all righteousness. And so our failures can be replaced with his victory, and that is very good news. Now, there are five things about the temptation of Christ that I want us to see. Number one, Jesus was tested by God, and he was tempted by Satan. Now, you'll notice the first word in the very first verse says, then. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And so, Matthew is indicating here that we really shouldn't see any time lapse between the baptism of Jesus and the temptation of Jesus. In fact, uh, the God, in the Gospel of Mark, he put it a little bit more forcefully when he said immediately Jesus was driven into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. One person has once remarked, uh, made a remark saying that when Jesus, that Jesus was driven into the wilderness before his hair was even, even dry. I mean, Jesus came out of the waters of baptism, and immediately the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Now, we have to also see how the temptation was not purposeless, but it was very purposeful. Okay, so we shouldn't think of it in this way. Uh, the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness, and it just so happened that Satan happened to be in the wilderness, and therefore Satan came and tempted Jesus. But rather, the, the idea is almost as if Satan is in the wilderness waiting for Jesus, and the Spirit of God drives Jesus into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted by Satan. I want to ask you, do you have room for that? Do you have room for that? Now we know from James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, that it says, Let no one say when he is tempted... I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And that also shows you that the temptations that we experience are very often different than the kind of temptation that Jesus is experiencing here in Matthew chapter 4, because Jesus' temptation came on the outside of him. It came from the devil. But James is telling us, even as Christians, that very often the temptations uh, that we experience are the one, those ones that just arise right out of our hearts. And our own sinful desires uh, entangle us and lure us into sin. And so, and so Jesus being tempted in the wilderness was by the devil, and the devil is tempting him on the outside. And so this section is really about God testing Jesus. Notice it is not God tempting Jesus. God did lead him into the wilderness, but he was tempted by the devil. The devil here is seen as the one who is doing the tempting, and God has a purpose in leading Jesus here as the one who is going to fulfill all righteousness and do what no man has ever done before. So, Jesus was tested by God and he was tempted by Satan. Secondly, we also see that Jesus is God's true son. I mean, where else 
have we seen the wilderness, the number 40, and God's Son before? What do you think about when you think of wilderness, the number 40, and God's Son? Anybody want to give a stab at it? Israel was God's son spending 40 years in the wilderness? Absolutely. You hit it head on. It's to recall Israel's experience in the wilderness when God was testing them for 40 years when they were wandering there in the desert. And Israel in the Old Testament is called God's son. And so Matthew is doing something that we have already seen he's been doing. He's showing us that Jesus is reliving or recapitulating the history of Israel, and he is reversing Israel's failures. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, it says, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would, be kept, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So how did Israel do with that test? They failed, didn't they? They complained, they murmured, and they grumbled. So much so that they even wanted to go back to Egypt. But Israel, as God's son, failed to live according to every word, whereas Jesus did not fail. And so Jesus, and so Matthew is indicating once again that Jesus is the true Israel that failed what ethnic Israel failed to do. But the thing is, is that not only has Israel failed, but we have all failed. And so the third thing I want us to see here is that Jesus is the last Adam. And that's, what, that's why we read Matthew, or sorry, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, where Paul enters into a discussion over two Adams, the first Adam and the second, or the Bible calls him the last Adam. Well, we can go back to Genesis and we see a similar thing going on with Adam uh, so what is going on here in Matthew chapter 4 when Satan came to tempt Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve ended up yielding to Satan's temptation and because of that, uh, God cursed this world and, and sin had broken into this world. But you know, there is a difference because when we look at the temptation of Adam, we see that Adam was tempted in paradise. Adam was tempted on a full stomach. Adam was tempted... Uh, even while he had everything that he could ever ask for. Jesus, on the other hand, was tempted in a curse-laden world. He was tempted on an empty stomach. He was tempted in one of the most God-forsaken places, which was the wilderness of Judea. And it was a desert. It was an abandoned place that even animals would flee from. The only thing that lived in the wilderness of Judea was scorpions and spiders and a few kind of birds. Jesus was tempted on an empty stomach. He wasn't, able, he wasn't even able to eat locusts and wild honey like John the Baptist was. And so the circumstances of Jesus' temptation exceed Adam's by a long shot. And so although there is a difference in the circumstances of the temptation between the first and the last Adam, there is also a similarity between the temptation of Jesus and Adam that we do not want to miss, and that is that both Adam and Jesus were tempted as real humans. Now, I'm going to raise a question, and the answer to this question is has been very disputed throughout the history of Christendom, and it has to do with whether or not Jesus was impeccable or whether Jesus was peccable. And the difference is only to say that was Jesus unable to sin, or that would be impeccability, or was he peccable such that theoretically it is possible for Jesus to have sinned? Now, if I were to be asked that question, my answer would be yes. Now, let me tell you, <laughs> uh, well, actually, 
I know what you're thinking. I actually meant yes to the second question. I believe that Jesus was peccable as a man. Um, now, there's theologians on both sides of this debate, and so this certainly is not a hill to die on, because no one is saying that Jesus sinned. Both groups are saying that Jesus is without sin, he never sinned, he was perfect. It only has to do with a hypothetical possibility. But I think that the hypothetical possibility is nevertheless important to understand. Um, I think, you know, why would someone say that it was impossible for Jesus to have sinned? And the primary reason for that is because Jesus is one person with two natures. He has a human nature and he has a divine nature. And according to James chapter 1, God is unable to tempt people and he's also not able to be tempted himself. And so the two natures of Christ, we have to realize, are inseparable, and they belong to the person of Christ. And so since Jesus is also God, then that means, um, by deduction, that it, that it must mean that he was unable to sin, because God cannot sin. Now, I appreciate the, the desire to protect the sinlessness of Christ. And I wholeheartedly believe in the sinlessness of Christ. However, I do believe that with this kind of thinking, that it has a tendency to propagate the old monophysite error. You see, in the early church, there were heated doctrinal battles that were taking place surrounding the person of Christ. And people were saying different things about who Jesus was, and there was a lot of discussion and a lot of debate going on. But the Monophysites believe that Jesus had only one nature. Mono means one, and therefore Monophysite simply means one nature. Now, the end result of this is that, you know, when you look at Scripture, you see things about Jesus that seem to be describing you know, thing, things like that, that, that we go through. We hunger and we thirst. And then you look at other portions of Scripture where it's clear that he's being described as God. And so what ended up happening with the Monophysite, which was actually a heresy back then, was that you ended up um, kind of having the divine attributes of Jesus overpowering his humanity. And so you ended up with like a deified human nature or a humanized divine nature, and in the end, you did damage to both the humanity and the deity of Christ. But at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, they declared that Jesus was truly God and truly man. They rightly recognized that you cannot separate the natures, they belong to the person of Christ, but nevertheless, you must absolutely not fail to distinguish between the two natures of Christ. Now, I'm not saying that people who believe in that Jesus was impeccable is guilty of being a monophysite. I'm only saying that there's tendencies that seem to be similar to that old error. And here's why. Jesus in Scripture is the last Adam. When God created Adam and placed him in the Garden of Eden, Adam, according to the book of Ecclesiastes, was made upright. And God placed him in the Garden. He was without sin, but he did have the possibility of sinning, obviously, because we, there, there is sin today. And Jesus, in like manner, I believe when he entered into this world, he entered into the same state as the first Adam, only with different circumstances, which was living in a cursed world. Jesus was, was born without sin. However, just like the first Adam, he was born um, certainly with the hypothetical possibility that he might sin. Now, obviously, he didn't. Um, but the reason why that um, is important to underscore is that what did Jesus do when he came to this earth? He came, in effect, to, to do exactly what the first Adam failed to do. Jesus needed to remain faithful to God throughout the entirety of his life, just as Adam was commanded to remain faithful to God. And so Jesus has done what the first Adam has failed to do. And even when you look at verse 4, where Jesus says, you know, man shall not live by bread alone. He says man. 
And Jesus is describing himself in terms uh, of being a man here. And so when we look at the temptation of Christ, we have to realize that he is enduring through these temptations in the very same way that you or I might endure through them. And obviously we would have failed. But the point is, is that he's going through it as a man. And so even when Jesus is quoting scripture at the temptation, in these temptations, it's not like, well, you know, Jesus is God and Jesus knows everything. Uh, you know, God knows everything. God knows all the scripture. And therefore, Jesus can just quote scripture um, verbatim uh, without any effort. Not at all. We know from the Bible that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And when he was growing up, he would have been instructed by Joseph and, and Mary, who would have been teaching him the scriptures. He would have been well acquainted with the scriptures. He, he was in his father's house, and he was constantly studying the scriptures, so that when years later, when he would meet Satan head on, he was prepared to defeat him and to demolish Satan underneath his feet. But when you look at verse 2, it says, And after fasting, for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Of course he would have been hungry. He would have been hungry just as you and I would have been hungry. And if he would have continued to fast, he would have died of starvation like anyone else. He was a real man. He was starving of hunger. And his hunger testifies to his humanity. I want to ask you, are you hungry? I don't mean what's coming up for lunch after this sermon. Are you hungry in your soul? You know, hunger is not a bad thing. Hunger is a very good thing. God created us to hunger and to thirst. So hunger is not a bad thing, but eating when you are not supposed to is. You know, think about it. There Jesus is fasting in the wilderness. Many other people are, are able to eat. And it's not like it's a bad thing to eat food, but it would have been a bad thing for Jesus to eat food in this situation because it was not the will of his Father for him to eat. And I think very often in life, you know, we might look at other individuals and we might look at other families. And we don't have what they have. And we might say to ourselves, God, why me? But why do they get to eat? Why do they get to enjoy these things? And here I am fasting. And you know what the devil does during those times? He comes to us, and in a still, small voice, he says, go, take and eat. And it's wrong because it's not in the Father's timing. And so maybe God is calling you to fast a little while longer. God may be calling you to fast a lot while longer, but however long it is, are you going to do the will of your Father? Well, let's consider how Jesus was faithful. And this is when we look at the temptations themselves. There are three temptations here. And each temptation can be understood by examining the temptation, and Jesus' response to it. So let's look at verses 3 and 4. It says, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now when you see that word if, if you are the Son of God, you should really understand it as since. Since you are the Son of God. Because in this temptation, Satan is not questioning Jesus' identity. Satan knows who Jesus is. He probably, maybe he was there to hear God the Father's voice from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I love. And when we look at, at uh, you know, demonic activity, with, activity within the Gospels, they always knew who Jesus was. I adjure you, Jesus, son of the Most High. Okay, so Satan knows who Jesus is. He's not questioning his identity, but he's causing him to reflect upon its implication. In other words, if you're truly the Son of God, surely you can use your divine powers to satisfy your own needs. And by the way, you're the Son of God. You're the Son of your Father. I mean, doesn't your Father care about you? Doesn't He love you? Doesn't He see that you're starving out here in the wilderness? So it should be okay for you to just use those divine powers of yours to turn these stones into bread to relieve you of all this pain. 
But the thing is, is that Satan was trying to get him to use his divine powers that were rightly his, but that he had voluntarily abandoned to carry out his father's mission here on earth, and this was not the right time to be using his divine powers. And so Jesus responds in verse 4 with saying, But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. But we do live with some bread, don't we? Nothing wrong with bread. Has there ever been a time when you've gone to a restaurant before? Maybe a really nice restaurant. You know, it's expensive, but you only do it a couple of times of the year. And you're going there for a nice dinner. You want a full course meal. You're going there for steak. You're going there for ribs. You're going there for roast beef. You're going there for a nice dinner. And I can remember when I went to Louisville, Kentucky a couple of years ago. I was in Cape Breton. I flew down uh, to Kentucky. And my brothers also flew down from New Brunswick to Kentucky. And a bunch of my friends from New Brunswick, we all flew down for this conference, at the Together for the Gospel conference. And they wanted to take me to this restaurant that they loved that I hadn't been to, which was the Texas Roadhouse. And so they took me to the Texas Roadhouse, and we were really looking forward to it. We, I think most of us got steaks and fries and baked potatoes, and it was just excellent. But when you go to the Texas Roadhouse, they bring out some very amazing bread. I mean, some restaurants you go to, you know, they, they'll give you bread, but it's like in a wrapper, and it's dry. And then you go to these other restaurants, and bread is nice and warm, it's hot, and then they bring out that nice soft butter, and you know, you're going there for steak, and you're pl in your mind, it's like you're planning, I'm only going to eat maybe one piece, maybe two pieces of bread before my steak comes, but I mean, the bread is just so good, and you just keep eating it, and shoving it down, and it's just so good, um, but imagine that I left the Texas Roadhouse, and you came to me, and said, so what'd you have? And I said, bread. You'd say, what? You went to the Texas Roadhouse to just have bread? No one goes to restaurants, these nice restaurants, to just have bread. You need meat. And so the idea here is that we need more than just bread. We need meat. And that meat is the word of God. And that's what Jesus was living his life upon. Remember even in John chapter 4 when Jesus' disciples came to him to give him some food and Jesus said that I have food that you know not of. Literally, Jesus during his life was living on every word that has come from the mouth of God. And because of that, he was not going to give in to Satan's temptation. Now, the second temptation has to do with Satan tempting to test uh, the father's care over him. Look at verse 5. It says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Oh, look at what Satan's doing here. He's playing his good little game, isn't he? He's saying, Okay, Jesus, you want to play this little scripture game? Well, guess what? I know scripture too. But there's something that Satan does wrong when he quotes Scripture. He's able to quote Scripture, no doubt. Matter of fact, he knows Scripture very well. He probably knows Scripture than all of us do. But he always quotes Scripture out of context. In effect, Satan, we could say, has a bad hermeneutic. Hermeneutics is the study of interpretation. And one of the first... Um, principles of hermeneutics is the analogy of faith, that Scripture's best interpreter is Scripture itself. If you're having a problem with one passage of Scripture, there are other portions of Scripture that can help, help you understand what this passage of Scripture is all about. And that's very important to understand because there are many false prophets and there are many false teachers in our world today. And let me tell you, on the surface, they are going to sound biblical. They are going to sound like they're honoring Christ. It's going to sound right. But when you really uh, dig it out, you'll find that it is fraught with errors and sometimes severe heresy. So Satan quotes Psalm chapter 95, and he says, Okay, Jesus. He says, Don't you know that it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, 
On their heads they will bear you, and on their heads they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You see, what Satan is doing here is he's telling Jesus uh, that this psalm is about God's protection over people that are in danger. And Jesus, you're God's son, so certainly he cares about you. He loves you, and you can... You can have his love for you proved if you would just jump off the pinnacle of this temple. And since he loves you, he's going to send his angels and they're going to protect you so that your foot wouldn't be dashed against this stone. Well, the problem with Satan's quotation of Psalm chapter 95 verses 11 and 12 is that in context, the psalm promises God's protection for those serving God yet happen to find themselves in danger. It doesn't promise protection for creating a crisis in which we can just do foolish things, thinking that God is obligated to show his love and care in protecting us for doing something stupid. I mean, it would just be like me going up on the top of a mountain and say, I'm going to jump off a mountain because God cares for me and therefore he's not going to let me fall to the ground. That's utter nonsense because I am not choosing to trust in the Lord's will, which is expressed in his word. I am creating a crisis to try to prove that my God can do miracles and that he will do them for me. The problem here is that, well, look what Jesus says. He says in verse 7, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus is saying to Satan, Satan, you have to realize something here. I'm not to test God, because God is testing me. And he's testing me to see if I will be found faithful, and my job is to live upon the word of God. You see, for both Israel and Jesus, demanding miraculous protection as proof of God's care was wrong. The appropriate attitude is trust and obedience. And so once again, Jesus is faithful to God. And then we come to the third temptation. In verse 8 it says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, when you first read that, it might not seem like much of a temptation to Christ. But we also, I mean, what authority does Satan have to give all these kingdoms to Christ? But we do need to recognize that there actually is a sense when we look at the scriptures in which these kingdoms, these nations were under the authority of Satan. But it was not a sovereign authority. It was a derived authority. Because God was working with the kingdom and the nation of Israel and the Old Testament, and God basically allowed Satan to have all these other nations and all these other kingdoms. But it was promised in the Old Testament that those kingdoms and these nations were going to be given over to the Messiah. Psalm chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, it says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me. And I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. And so when Satan comes to Jesus to offer him these kingdoms that were his, not by a right, but only because God allowed him to have them for a temporary season, Satan's coming to him and saying, I'll give these to you now. If you just bow down. And Jesus, you, you, don't need to, you don't need to fall prostrate on the floor or anything. Jesus, you just need to bend your knee a little. Just bend your knee a little, and I'll give them over to you. Now, obviously, even if Jesus did, Satan wouldn't have given them to him, because we know that he's a liar and the father of lies, and he prom every, every time he promises, he never delivers. But what, Jesus, what Satan is doing here is he's trying to get Jesus to avoid the cross. Because remember, after Jesus died, and after he rose again, and before he ascended into heaven, what did he say? He said, now, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go get the nations. You see, in order for the nations to be given over to Christ, it was incumbent upon Christ to die upon the cross. Otherwise, the nations could never be won. 
And so Satan is trying to get Jesus to avoid the cross. Remember that incident in Matthew chapter 16 where Peter made that great confession and he said, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus went on to talk about how he needs to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be given over to the council, and he's going to die, and he's going to, be, and he's going to rise on the third day. And Peter came to Jesus and said, oh no, no, that's not going to happen with you, Jesus. We're not going to let that happen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, for your mind is set on the things of man rather than the things of God. And the way of man is never the way of the cross. And that's why just after Jesus said that, he went to talk to his disciples about their need of bearing a cross and being willing to carry that cross. And so Jesus, in effect here, when he says in verse 10, then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, with confidence, once again, in God's words and in what God is going to do. Satan flees because Jesus does not yield to him because, he, because Jesus refuses to take the shortcut. He knows that he needs to go to the cross. Well, the last thing I want us to see here is the temptation was temporary. Look at verse 11. It says, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Temptations are always temporary. This wasn't the last time that Satan was going to tempt him. He was going to look for another opportune time. But at this point, um, the temptations had come to an end, and Jesus came out on top. He came out victorious. And when Jesus said, Be gone, Satan, uh, he said it with authority, and Satan fled from him. And when you flee from temptation, you'll come to find that Satan will flee you. But we also have to recognize that in this life, he's always going to come back. And he's always going to come and attack. We know that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And so the temptations, nevertheless, were, temp were temporary. And there's a little bit of irony here when it says that angels came and were ministering to him. I mean, that's exactly what Sa Satan wanted angels to minister to him prematurely. But angels came to minister to him at just the right time. And I don't know the exact way in which these angels ministered to him, but I can only imagine that after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, that the angels came to Jesus with one of the best buffets that you could possibly ever eat. I don't know if that's the case, but might be. <laughs> but in closing, I just want to ask you, are you living by bread alone? You know, maybe you're in a fast right now, the enemy is trying to cause you to get your eyes focused off his word, to be focused on mere bread. Are you putting the Lord to the test? Are you doubting God's love and his care by questioning his word rather than trusting and obeying? And finally, we have to see that Christianity without a cross is not Christianity at all. And so are you being tempted to grab the crown without grabbing the cross first. We see that Jesus is our Savior, and because of all that he went through, he is our sympathetic high priest. And you know, this can sometimes be denied, because Jesus never sinned, right? And so we think to ourselves, can he really sympathize with me? But I want to tell you this. Imagine two weightlifters are in the gym, and they're going to lift 300 pounds. And the first weightlifter goes, and he's going to bench 300 pounds. He lifts that weight, the weight comes down, but he is unable to lift that weight back up. So some people come to help him lift the weight back up. And the second contender comes, he lifts that weight, the weight comes down, and with great strength, he lifts that 300 pounds up and, and, does it, and lifts the weight. Let me ask you this. Which weightlifter felt the heaviness of the weight, of the weight more? The one who didn't lift it? Or the one who did? The one who failed or the one who succeeded? It was the one who succeeded that felt the heaviness of the weight more because he was actually able to lift it and he knew what it took to lift that kind of weight. Well, if we were to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Well, what kind of ability did Christ have? 
Certainly Jesus felt the weight of temptation more than anyone else has ever felt it in the history of the world. And so be encouraged because Jesus can sympathize with you. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 through 16, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, Jesus is our Savior who has won the victory over temptation, and because of that, he is also our sympathetic high priest who can also give us grace and strength so that we can have victory over temptation as well. So let's just close by going to that throne of grace. Father, we thank you so much for the victory of Christ over the devil. God, we thank you for not giving in to temptation when it was so difficult, when you were at your weakest point, when you were most vulnerable, and yet Satan could not touch you. And God, when we look into our own lives, we see that we are nothing like Christ, that we have failed, and Lord, we feel the pull of temptation so strongly, and often we give in. So Lord, we confess that we are in need of forgiveness, and you're washing and you're cleansing but Lord, we know that you have not left us without any help at all, but that you have given us the Holy Spirit in which we can yield ourselves to your control. And so I just pray that you would help us this week, Lord, to defeat temptation, to have victory over it, to flee the devil, and to focus on you and your word so that we would be truly satisfied. God, I thank you so much for your word and all that we learn here at the temptation of Jesus. Lord, I thank you so much for these people who love you, who want to honor you. I pray that you bless them this week. In Jesus' name, amen.